Welcome again to Threshing Floor. We are doing the gospel criticism. That's lesson seven. It's great. It's a great night to hear the word. So get your papers, get your pencils, get everything you need ready to take great notes, you know? And we are studying this wonderful book that I've been going over, you know? The, the Cradle, the Cross, and the Crown. It's a great book. You could find it on Amazon, eBay, even Walmart have it. You know, just check online. Whichever place they have it the cheapest for you, get a copy. It's a great book. And it goes well with this lecture that we are doing chapter by, ch you know, chapter by chapter. We're in lesson number seven. So, Get yourself ready for it. And this, you will enjoy this lecture, I promise you. But for now, share this video, like this video, and also subscribe to our page so you can know when the next time we're posting another lecture or we're doing another uh, Bible reading with explanation, whatever what we are doing, you'll be able to see it. You know? Do that. When you finish, do subscribe with everything, donate, donate toward our ministry so we could continue to serve those less fortunate than ourselves with your donation and our staff, we will be able to do everything that we can possibly do to help those who are in need, who are less fortunate than us. Because it's through people like you, your good hearted person, who doing what the will of God say, what the Bible clearly state to help those in need. And when you give to those in need, it's just, it's just like you are giving to Jesus himself. So let's do that. You know, we together as a team can make a change and it start with us and it start with you. Okay. Peace be unto you and your home and your family in Jesus name. For now, get yourself ready. For the for the for lecture number seven. This is lecture number seven. Oops. Entitled Gospel Criticism. What we're gonna do in this lecture is we're gonna look at three particular areas relevant to the study of the gospels. The first we're gonna look at mm -hmm. various critical schools that have been used in looking at the gospels. The schools that actually had their point of origin with the Enlightenment. So we'll take a look at those. We're also going to be looking at the Sinaiticus. over from scratch. Sorry for that, people. Sorry for that. Just a little mixed up. Start over. This is lecture number seven, titled Gospel Criticism. What we're going to do in this lecture is we're going to look at three particular areas relevant to the study of the Gospels. The first, we're going to look at various critical schools that have been used in looking at the Gospels, the schools that actually had their point of origin with the Enlightenment. So we'll take a look at those. We're also going to be looking at the synoptic problem uh, briefly, uh, get a general overview of what it is, how it came about. And two differing approaches to the synoptics that are found today within the evangelical community. We'll wrap up the lecture by looking at the quest for the historical Jesus, which again, it logically connects with the synoptic question and the critical schools. So let's begin with our introduction and we'll move into the critical material. Uh, one of the most devastating attacks on the Bible took place in the 18th century from a very unlikely personality. Thomas Paine, who is best known for, or was best known as a political thinker and wrote political pamphlets supporting the American Revolution, also authored a scathing critique of the Bible in a book titled The Age of Reason. Uh, Payne was a deist and a rationalist, and because of that, he was also an anti-supernaturalist, which means he did not believe, along with others of that thinking, uh, that there was, were supernatural activities, miracles, for example, that took place within the natural realm. So 
they would follow a very strict understanding of natural laws. Now, Paine, because of that, could be called a child of the Enlightenment, and because of his viewpoints, he certainly did not consider the Bible to be trustworthy, and that's what led him to write his critique of the Bible, which, by the way, is still in print, so you can get a copy, or I should say the publisher is Prometheus Books, which uh, that publishing house has been in existence to publish primarily books that attack Christianity. It's uh, a major publisher of atheistic material, skeptical material, and so on and so forth. Irving Hexham, professor of religion at the University of Calgary, says this about the Age of Reason. Everywhere it was read, believers lost their faith, and skeptics were convinced they were right. So Payne's book had a significant impact on, uh, on how people viewed the Bible. In fact, Dr. Hexham has traced Payne's influence not only from that period of time with the publication of The Age of Reason, but also with its ongoing influence on the other thinkers, even taking it up to Joseph Smith and the origins of Mormonism. So though we don't hear much about The Age of Reason today, it is still a, uh, it's a book that I think Christians should read, be familiar with, at least those who are well informed, because the criticisms that Paine levels against the Gospels are some of the same criticisms that we hear today from popular atheistic uh, writers. What's interesting is that Paine sent a copy of the manuscript to Benjamin Franklin, who was a publisher, among other things, and wanted Franklin's opinion. In a letter responding to Paine, Franklin advised him to burn the manuscript because, in Franklin's opinion, it would have no benefit to society. Uh, Franklin believed that religion was critical to the social and moral stability of society, so naturally he would see Paine's book as detrimental to that, to that uh, uh, influence. Uh, as an aside, I want to point out that it's interesting, Benjamin Franklin was very close friends with George Whitfield, the great British evangelist who held revivals here uh, during that period of time. And Franklin would occasionally go to hear Whitfield preach because he really liked Whitfield. And I don't know if Franklin ever became a born-again believer, but if he uh, even went to one revival, which he did, attending one revival of Whitfield's, he would know the gospel very clearly. And also, because of Whitfield's influence, Franklin would have an appreciation for the importance of the Bible. So it's not unusual or not um, out of the ordinary that Ben Franklin would have such a negative reaction to Paine's writing. Uh, however, Paine went against Franklin's advice and went ahead and published the book. It infuriated numerous founding fathers, such as John Adams, Samuel Adams, Benjamin Rush, John Dickinson, Charles Carroll, John Witherspoon, and John Jay. Payne's work, though significant, was not alone in its attacks on the Bible. Those attacks were actually uh, ramping up during the Enlightenment because of the rationalistic thinking of, of that period. The anti-supernatural, rationalistic, and deistic thinking that characterized the so-called Enlightenment brought about an end of 1,700 years of fidelity to the Scriptures and Christianity. Now, prior to the Enlightenment, 1,700 years would be considered the age of faith. Faith was the dominant feature within the Church. It, it was the focal point of Christianity, and it was the Christian influence that was quite substantial. However, with the Enlightenment, that inaugurated a vigorous attack on the Bible, in particular the Gospels, and it brought about what, would be, what we would call the Age of Reason. With the Enlightenment came a massive shift away from the primacy of faith, which you characterized Christendom up to that time, uh, to a new paradigm, that new paradigm being rationalism. Rationalism exalted the supremacy of human reason. With this intellectual revolution, Scripture was subjected to man's reason, which was informed by empiricism. Now, I want to make a clear distinction, though, between the use of reason and rationalism, because unfortunately, uh, I've come across situations where people tend to equate the two. 
reason in and of itself is not a bad thing. Obviously, we use reason in doing theology. You can't do theology without using reason, because reason is what we do to uh, organize our thoughts. Now, where reason is criticized within the Christian evangelical community, it usually comes to the field of apologetics, and the question is, it, is it reasonable or is it appropriate to use reason to make arguments for God's existence or to defend the Bible, so on and so forth? And I firmly believe it is. We should give good reasons for why we believe the Bible. We should be able to give good reasons for why we believe God exists. I believe that an individual who is a non-believer can, by the power of reason, good rational arguments, be brought to theism. Now, I want to make a qualification here. I'm not saying that a person can be brought to salvation through reason. I do believe the Holy Spirit can use rational thought and the reasonable arguments for God's existence and other applications of reason in dealing with Christianity to convict somebody, and reason can be used to interpret and explain the gospel. And again, the Holy Spirit can use that to convict, but it requires the conviction of the Holy Spirit for someone to come to salvation. Uh, one of the great intellectuals of the Middle Ages, Thomas Aquinas, has been falsely accused of trying to argue or use reason to argue people into heaven, and that's not true. Aquinas did not believe that. And so, historically, there's been a school of thought within the evangelical community that has resisted the use of reason. And uh, I want to emphasize that reason is important, and it is a very good tool to use in articulating our Christian faith. Rationalism, on the other hand, is the illegitimate use of reason. Rationalism take the, takes the position that man becomes the measure of all things intellectually or rationally. So uh, we want to make sure we make a clear distinction between rationalism and the use of reason. So with the Enlightenment, we see an intellectual revolution and that revolution had a number of negative effects. First of all, within that revolution, we see the rise and tremendous influence of deism. Now, deism is a worldview. It's actually a subcategory of monotheism. Uh, some people don't categorize it that way. I do. Uh, deism does embrace the viewpoint that there is one supreme being. On the other hand, reason, or excuse me, deism does not believe that that supreme being has any interaction with his creation. It holds that there is a, it did away, deism did away with a personal, imminent God for a God who is distant and disengaged from man's affairs. On the other hand, Christians, Christian monotheists, Trinitarian monotheism teaches that God not only is transcendent, He's distinct from what he's made, but he's also eminent, which means he does engage with his creation. And we see that in Scripture, where God interacts with mankind through propositional revelation and his uh, presence, manifesting his presence in various ways. As a result of deism, man became the measure of all things, which is a philosophy that actually goes all the way back to the pre-Socratic philosopher, Protagoras, who lived from 490 to 420 B.C. Along with deism came an anti-supernaturalism, and this denied miracles. This naturally led to a denial of the historicity of such foundational doctrines as the virgin birth, miracles of Jesus, and the resurrection. And as we will see later, anti-supernaturalism, because of its denial of miracles, would have a direct impact on how the historicity of the Gospels was interpreted and viewed. <laughs> Lastly, salvation was replaced by moralism. An example of this would be Thomas Jefferson. Uh, Jefferson believed that Jesus was a great moral teacher, but Jefferson, as uh, a true deist and anti-supernaturalist, did not believe in miracles. And so he took the Gospels and he pulled out of the Gospels those passages that had good moral teaching that he believed was beneficial to society, but at the same time he rejected the miraculous content. 
And what ended up out of that uh, editing process, if you will, by Thomas Jefferson is what has been popularly called the Jefferson Bible. It's a small book, and it contains merely citations, uh, uh, gospel citations dealing with moral issues. Now, out of the Enlightenment came these schools of critical thought. Uh, the umbrella school is called historical criticism, and it has some sub-disciplines, which we'll look at here shortly. Historical criticism became the new area of scholarly study, subjecting the Bible to strict scrutiny, and in doing so, it called into question the historical integrity of the Gospels. Uh, one writer says that historical criticism sought to understand the ancient text in light of its historical origins, time, and place in which it was written, as well as the sources behind it. Uh, this particular school of thought really came into full development in the 19th and 20th centuries, in particular with German liberal thinking of the 19th century. Now, historical criticism has a number of sub-disciplines. The first is source criticism, which was dominant in the 17th and 18th centuries. Source criticism read the Bible from a secular perspective, and in doing so, it sought to reveal the contradictions and the repetitions in the text. It also argued for sources, written sources, that were uh, behind the text. Under source criticism, we have two theories. There's the two-source theory and the four-source theory. Now, the two-source theory simply says that Luke's and Matthew's Gospels used Mark and an obscure source called Q. Now, Q is the letter abbreviation, if you will, for quell, which means source. The second theory is the four-source theory. It's, it holds to four sources, first being the priority of Mark, second, the use of the Q document, thirdly, documents or material called M, which means special material unique to Matthew, and then there's L, which is special material unique to Luke. The second sub-discipline of historical criticism is form criticism. Form criticism seeks to uncover the oral tradition embedded in the texts and their respective forms. It includes individual sayings and narratives that are joined together. It naturally assumes a non-historical interpretation of Jesus' title as the Son of God, which is interpretive, not objective history. In other words, the Gospels consist of isolated, detached material that has been pulled together. It's a conglomeration of sources, essentially. The third and last sub-discipline, which is very popular today within the evangelical community, New Testament scholarship, is redaction criticism. This deals with how the authors, acting as editors, selected and shaped their sources in composing the Gospels. So those are the three sub-disciplines of historical criticism. Now we want to look at the philosophical influences that were dominant during the Enlightenment and also underpin, or were the uh, underpinnings of liberal scholarship relevant to the Gospels. First is empiricism. Empiricism applies the scientific method to gospel studies, resulting in an anti-supernatural lens through which the gospels are viewed. So empiricism would essentially take a natural law perspective. In other words, anything that violates natural laws, observable laws, what can be observed in nature, would, would be rejected. Along with that is rationalism. Rationalism, coupled with empiricism, placed human reason as the means by which all things were to be evaluated. If something conflicted with reason, it was rejected. So you can see how this approach to the Bible would logically result in denying the reality of the miracles found in the Gospels. And I might add, because of that thinking, the historicity of the Gospels we've called into question because the thinking is, since miracles do not take place, 
any historical document that records miracles in a favorable light is automatically suspect as a credible source. The third item is deism, which we briefly talked about that. A deism is the worldview that says God created the world, then separated himself from it. He has no interaction with creation, and as a result, this logically leads to anti-supernaturalism. So those three work very much hand in hand with each other. Now there's two other philosophical approaches that we want to look at. One is skepticism, which says nothing can be known for sure, but it's but it is be of one's own existence or the external world. This would mean you cannot know anything about God and the Bible cannot be taken at face value. Now, I believe the problem you have with skepticism is it is self-defeating. Because if you're skeptical and nothing can be known for sure, then that means skepticism itself cannot be known for sure. So it, it actually becomes nonsensical and can actually lead to despair because you can't know anything with certainty. The second is Romanticism. Now, Romanticism it was predominantly found within the literary and artistic communities. It was a reaction to the cold, sterile rationalism, and it emphasized feelings and emotions. Uh, romanticism actually had what I would call an existentialist tendency, or you could say it naturally led to existentialism. For example, you could deny the historicity of the resurrection, and yet embrace the resurrection account, and from that have an existential spiritual experience, if you will. So an existentialist approach to the Bible would not necessarily have to believe that what is contained in the Bible is necessarily true, but you can derive from that a, a type of experience. I guess one you could compare to reading a novel. And you read a novel, and, and depending on how that novel is written and the way the story unfolds, can affect your emotions, and it can uh, cause uh, inner positive feelings. And so a romantic approach to the Bible could do the same thing. As with a novel, the novel does not have to be true. It merely has to uh, influence in an existentialist spiritual way, or I should say, in reading it, produced that kind of an effect. There's an interesting illustration of this in a panel discussion that took place uh, between John Warwick Montgomery and three other theologians. I want to quote to you a statement that Montgomery made in that panel discussion because I think it's instructive uh, for what we're talking about. He writes, the Christian faith is built upon gospel that is good news, and there is no news, good or bad, of something that didn't happen. I personally am much disturbed by certain contemporary movements in theology which seem to imply that we can have the faith regardless of whether anything happened or not. I believe absolutely that the whole Christian faith is premised upon the fact that at a certain point in time, under Pontius Pilate, a certain man died and was buried and three days later rose from the dead. If in some way you could demonstrate to me that Jesus never lived, died, or rose again, then I would have to say I have no right to my faith. Now what Montgomery is saying there, and I think he's absolutely right, Christianity, by sovereign design, is grounded in history, in space and time. That gives a tangible, objective evidence of its trustworthiness and its reliability and its reality, as opposed to, say, Buddhism or Confucianism or Hinduism, which are all historical religions. So when God made himself known in the Old Testament, in the Old Testament and the New Testament, he made himself known in space and time, in history. In fact, if you read the Old Testament, you'll find over and over again where God continually reminds Israel of historical events in the past that God brought about for her benefit, namely the Exodus. So God uses historical markers to demonstrate to Israel his presence, his care for them, and you see the same thing in the New Testament. 
the Gospels provide us with historical evidence and proofs and demonstrations of the historicity of Jesus Christ and things that he did. These are historical markers. And you see that in the book of Acts, where Luke records the history of the church, or the, or the building of the church, through the apostles. So history is very important to the Christian faith, and it cannot be discounted. Now, there are theologians, and one in response to Montgomery's statement made this, uh, made this observation or comment. There are theologians like the guy I'm referring to that responded to Montgomery, to take the view that they really, it doesn't matter whether or not certain events in the New Testament actually took place, in particular, say, the resurrection. They are not, that does not affect their faith at all. Now, that's an existentialist approach to the Christian faith, and frankly, it's, it's what I would call a hollow approach, because if something did not happen historically as far as the Gospels are concerned, then there's no trustworthiness there, there's no reliability. We really have nothing in which to ground our faith. It becomes very subjective. First Corinthians chapter 15, the Apostle Paul devotes considerable material there to make the case for the historical reality of the resurrection. Nowhere in the Old or New Testaments is the history of the Christian faith discounted. In fact, it is a dominant feature of the Old and New Testaments. So I think we can safely say that the historical grounding of the Christian faith is critical to the integrity of the Christian faith, and prophets and apostles both appealed to it. <clears throat> so I would say that Romanticism essentially leaves a significant epistemological vacuum. There is no fixed truth. The only recourse is ultimately existentialism. Now let's take a look at the synoptic problem. Prior to the 17th century, the church held to a strict view of the Bible's trustworthiness. A New Testament scholar, David Farnell, writes this. He says, quote, The first 1700 years of the church, the independence view regarding the synoptic origins prevailed. That is, each gospel writer worked independently of the others, in other words, without relying on another canonical gospel as a source of information. Consequently, the gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John constitute four independent accounts of the life of Jesus. More specifically, no direct literary dependence exists among the gospels. <clears throat> in other words, no gospel writer directly used the work of another to compose his gospel as assumed by modern source-dependence hypotheses. The four are separate, independent eyewitness testimonies to the life of Jesus, unquote. Now, I want to say at the outset of our examination of the synoptic problem that I totally agree with this statement. I personally do not believe that the gospel writers borrowed or copied from each other. I do believe that they were independent in their composition of their gospels, and they wrote under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and as a result, their Gospels are both inerrant and infallible. Now, I'm sorry to say that that is not the popular view in modern evangelical New Testament scholarship. And it's even getting worse among a number of New Testament scholars when it comes to interpreting, or I should say reinterpreting, a lot of the material that is found in the Gospels. And again, this goes back to the influence of historical criticism and the philosophical uh, underpinnings of historical criticism. So we could say that deism, rationalism, empiricism, romanticism, and skepticism all came together in one way or another in the context of the Enlightenment and impacted every area of human intellectual activity. And as has been pointed out, the Christian faith in general, and the Bible in particular, were subjected to intense criticism. Out of the milieu of anti-supernaturalistic thinking came a new approach to the Bible, as we've already discussed, in particular the Gospels, namely historical criticism. This theory, heavily influenced by Enlightenment thinking, did not hold to a supernaturalistic view of the Scriptures, which naturally led to seeing the text as nothing more than the product of men. Now, 
that being the case, that means the historicity of the Gospels is in question because you strip the Gospels of the miraculous and you have nothing but historical material. Just raw facts. But there's another problem with that as well. If miracles do not take place, as the anti-supernaturalist worldview would, would argue, then an historical document that does record such activity in a favorable light would automatically be suspect because it's contradicting uh, empiricism. And so the Gospels, being historical documents, come under suspicion as historically reliable and trustworthy, which also means that uh, what we know about Jesus becomes suspect. And so now, with the three Gospels, the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you have a problem. You have what is called, falsely so, the Synoptic Problem. How do we now reconcile the Gospel accounts that are in conflict with each other? Because if there's no inspiration, then those conflicting statements that you find between Matthew, Mark, and Luke are going to be considered contradictions. And logically so, because an anti-supernaturalist position would say that they're merely the compositions of men. So we have a situation now where the synoptic problem, as it was called, develops within the liberal context, because now they've got to figure out a way to reconcile these conflicting elements within the Gospels. So you have a problem, as many would call it, or has, or has it been historically uh, known to be. Now, within the synoptic issue, you have two theories. You have a two-gospel hypothesis, and you have a two-source theory. The two-gospel hypothesis was developed by a man named Griesbach. He denied the inspiration of the Bible. Yet, interestingly enough, he did believe that the Holy Spirit worked through two apostles, Matthew and John. Although they provided reliable testimony, they were not inerrant. Griesbach himself was influenced by New Testament rationalist critics Michaelius and Simler. Simler had a disdain for the ancient antiquities of the church, and instead he was enamored with the new and the fresh, and, the, and uh, in doing so discarded the old ways of thinking. It's interesting because C.S. Lewis, who was, as hopefully many of you are have read C.S. Lewis, C.S. Lewis was a literary scholar. And so Lewis worked extensively with old documents, ancient documents, and he made the statement that such an opinion, discounting ancient antiquarian or ancient antiquities, would actually be chronological snobbery. In his opinion, if something has not been discredited or shown to be fraudulent, then it shouldn't be discarded. We also have the two-source theory, which is not to be confused with the two-gospel hypothesis. The two-source theory says one gospel author copied extensively from another writer. This comes about due to close similarities between the synoptic gospels. For example... Matthew reproduces 90% of Mark, of the subjects in Mark. Luke reproduces 50%. The majority of Mark's words are reproduced in Matthew and Luke. The chronological events in Mark are generally found in Matthew and Luke. Uh, with the exception of 200 verses that are common to Matthew and Luke but not found in Mark, Mark is represented substantially in the other two Gospels, Matthew and Luke. So this has led scholars to conclude that there's been some kind of borrowing or copying going on here. It's also argued under the two-source theory that the shortest gospel, Mark, is considered the earliest because had he come after Matthew and Luke, the assumption is that his gospel would have been longer. Mark is also considered to be more primitive in his style. And the Q material common in Matthew and Luke is missing in Mark. 
So this would show that Mark K. First did not have access to the Q material that is found in Matthew and Luke. Now, what are some of the criticisms or responses to these uh, theories? First of all, extensive research into the amount of agreement reveals that there is not enough agreement to support literary dependency. In fact, there are extensive differences between the synoptics. Second of all, the argument from order does not prove anything. It can be used to prove Mark copied Matthew and Luke. And then lastly, the arguments from brevity, that is Mark being shorter than the other two, does not prove anything regarding priority. Again, the argument can go both ways. Mark could have come last. He merely abbreviated Matthew and Luke. Then the primitive style, again, this is a purely subjective viewpoint and it presupposes mark and priority. It, it really doesn't have any bearing on, on chronology as far as who came first. Now, I wanna, there's one more, Luke's prologue, that I want to talk about, but I want to just make reference here real quickly. There's no reason why we should say that there is a synoptic problem, in fact, it's unavoidable that we have three different accounts or three distinct accounts of the life of Jesus. Or I should say this, you have three Gospels, three writers that are called the synoptics. They're writing about the same person. And the sources that they would use, eyewitness accounts, are certainly going to be limited. So logically, one could say, that if three different writers are going to write about the same individual, naturally there's going to be a lot of overlap in what they say, simply because they're writing a very, on a very narrow issue, that is the life of Jesus. And so they're all going to be recording similar events, as we clearly see. It'd be no different than if someone today were, you had three historians writing about the life of General Patton, and let's say they discussed, uh, they, they researched their work, interviewing those who served with Patton during World War II and whatever other information they would get, and they start writing their biography of Patton. If you compare those three, certainly you're going to see some of the same material stated among the three historians. But at the same time, you're going to see some differences. You may see new material, even some material in one author's biography that you don't find in the other two. That doesn't mean there's a contradiction, and it doesn't mean any of those historians copied from each other. It merely means that they, writing about the same person, had access to the same information, and in some cases, differing information. So, it's not unusual or out of the ordinary that Matthew, Mark, and Luke, writing about Jesus, are going to be uh, duplicating, or I should say, uh, recording some of the same information. And at the same time, they're going to be, have different pieces of information. And also, when they do record similar incidents like the, uh, the tomb, the visitation of the tomb, or the gathering demoniac. There's differences in the synoptics as to how many angels were at the tomb or how many demon-possessed individuals. Were there one? Were there two? This is not a contradiction. It merely is a, a, a different perspective that you find within the gospel writers themselves. So there's really not the, not the problem that it's made out to be. Now let's talk about Luke's prologue. If you read verses 1 through 4 in Luke's prologue, he tells Theophilus that he is setting about to write an account of the things that Theophilus evidently has been taught or heard about. And verse 4 is very important because in that verse Luke says, I'm going to write in such a way that Theophilus will have certainty about what has been written or what he has been told or taught. Now, logically... If Luke borrowed from Mark, then what Luke would be saying in verse 4 is that Mark is not adequate, or Mark is an insufficient source. 
which I would consider that to be a significant problem as far as inspiration is concerned. Because if Luke did borrow from one of the other Gospels, Mark in particular, and in some, in some circles some might say Matthew, but if Luke borrowed from one of these Gospels, and then he writes what he did in verse 4, he's discounting his sources as inadequate. Furthermore, Why would Luke even bother to write an account if these other two sources were available? It would make more sense that he would refer Theophilus to pre-existing gospel accounts. But we don't see that. And I think, for me personally, I believe Luke's prologue is a strong argument for independence of the gospel writers. Now the last thing is the document Q. The only reason Q is cited by scholars is to supply the two-source theory with a much-needed second source to explain material that is common to Matthew and Luke, but not in Mark. It also assumes that Matthew and Luke did not use eyewitnesses or were eyewitnesses. Furthermore, there is no extant or existing Q document, nor are there any references to such a document or anything comparable in ancient writings, post-New Testament ancient writings, the Church Fathers in particular. So the Q document really is what I consider to be spurious. In fact, it is losing a lot of its credibility within New Testament scholarship, even among uh, those who are not conservatives, which is a good thing. But as long as there are those who embrace historical criticism and its sub-disciplines, the Q document is going to be very important to them because it fills in the gaps. Now, lastly, what about the historical Jesus, the quest for the historical Jesus? This has been an interesting area of New Testament studies for centuries. And it actually got started as a result of the Enlightenment. And it is a natural, logical discipline that flows out of the Enlightenment rationalism and criticism of the Bible that has been dominating New Testament studies for centuries. As we indicated before, if you strip the Gospels of their miraculous content and you declare them to be questionable historically, then you have a significant dilemma here, and that dilemma is the question of who was Jesus Christ. Did he exist as an historical person? And if he did exist, what can we know about him? Because really, the only ex extra-biblical sources that we have about Jesus are found in Josephus and some Roman documents, but they're brief, and they really don't give us detailed information on Jesus Christ himself. So the Gospels, the four Gospels, are really the only documents that we have that give us detailed descriptions of the person and the work and the life of Jesus Christ. Now, if you call those documents into question, as the rationalists do, and if you deny their historicity or historical trustworthiness, then you have to come up with some way to determine what can we really know about Jesus Christ. And this is where the quest for the historical Jesus got started. So let's take a look at this, uh, this particular uh, scholarly area. Prior to the pre-critical period of biblical studies, the Enlightenment, there was no such thing as a quest for the historical Jesus. And this is logical. I mean, it, this is a significant statement. Because prior to the Enlightenment, the Church fully embraced the Gospels as historically trustworthy and the miracles as uh, a reality. So there was no conflict, there was no contradiction, there was no reason to question uh, these Gospels, and therefore there was no need to pursue some kind of discovery of who was the true Jesus. The Gospels were taken at face value as trustworthy. The Church studied Jesus Christ as he was portrayed in the Bible, but with the Enlightenment came historical criticism and the historical critical method. And this denied the historical reliability of the New Testament, in particular the Gospel records. As a result, this logically 
led to what would become the quests for the historical Jesus. The practitioners of the historical critical method questioned the historicity of the Gospels, and because of their rationalistic, deistic, anti-supernaturalism, they also denied the miracles spoken of in the Gospels. One writer uh, has this to say, quote, Anything that sounded supernatural had to be ruled out or reinterpreted. History was declared to be a closed system that ruled out any divine intervention. Anything miraculous, like the virgin birth, resurrection, divine healings, or casting out of demons, or predictive prophecy had to be either removed or explained in some historically acceptable way. Thus began the search for Jesus, as Enlightenment thinkers defined it, a Jesus who could fit selected basic human categories. So if you take the rationalistic pr approach that Enlightenment scholarship took, you have to reconfigure Jesus in, and mold him into strictly human categories. You have to remove from his life and his person anything that is miraculous or would conflict with empiricism or an empirical view of the Gospels. And so you logically end up with a Jesus who was a great moral teacher, no better, no worse than Confucius or any other great moral teacher, and as a result, he would not be what the Gospels teach us about him. So let's, uh, let's take a look again uh, from another angle, the pre-Enlightenment Jesus. For 1,700 years, the church supplied, or excuse me, studied Jesus strictly from what the biblical text had to say about him. In other words, he was studied, or the text was studied at its face value. And this included the unquestioned belief in the Gospels as historically trustworthy, including the accounts of Jesus' miracles. Now, the Enlightenment, or critical period, or age of reason period, view of Jesus took this posture. It was an anti-supernatural view of the Bible, fueled by a rationalistic, deistic worldview. Now, as a result, and this is very important, as a result of this, it led to viewing Jesus from two distinct areas, or divided him into two categories, if you will. And I'm not even sure I like the word categories, but it, it, it divided Jesus into two parts. The rationalistic side of Jesus' studies merely looked at Jesus as an historical figure, and this is where we get the phrase, the Jesus of history, or the quest for the historical Jesus. On the flip side, you had the Christ of faith. The Christ of faith was rejected by the Enlightenment rationalistic approach, and here are the reasons why. Let's again look at the Jesus of history and the Christ of faith more specifically. Let's define these clearly. The Jesus of history is this. He is the Jesus who is stripped of the miraculous content of the Gospels and presented as he really was, the historical reality of Jesus, a great teacher and religious leader, but not a miracle worker, not virgin born, and he was never raised from the dead as the Savior. Now, that is the Jesus of history. The Christ of faith, on the other hand, is the church's version of Jesus, an embellished, fabricated Jesus by his followers, and a Jesus who was transformed by the early church into something that he never was. Now, that's how the rationalists would view him, and how they would critique the church's perspective. So it can be said that the quests for the historical Jesus were attempts by liberal scholars to identify who the real Jesus was, not what the church historically made him out to be. That also goes for the gospel records. Anti-supernaturalism, by its very nature, dismissed the miraculous, and in doing so, it stripped the Bible of its divine origins and inspiration, and in turn necessarily did not see Jesus as anything but a man. Thus, liberal scholarship, given its denial of miracles, could not have a Jesus who was virgin-born, or miracles, or was raised from the dead. That being the case, the challenge in the quests has been to identify who the real Jesus of history was, 
not the church's so-called Christ of faith. So I would put it this way, succinctly. The historical Jesus is the Jesus of history. The Christ of faith is the Jesus as the church has configured him. So we can see that anti-supernatural rationalism affected the historiography of liberal scholarship in that anything contradicting reason, which was grounded in empiricism and naturalism, was dismissed as non-historical. So it would not be possible for Jesus to be both historical and the Christ of faith. Now let's look at the first quest. The first quest was inaugurated by a man named Hermann Romeros. He lived from 1694 to 1768. He wrote a book called Apology or Defense of the Rational Worshippers of God, which was a, quote, compendious attack on the historical foundations of Christian orthodoxy and a defense of deism, unquote, that comes from the Historical Handbook of Major Biblical Interpreters by Donald McKenna. Albert Schweitzer credited Remaras with initiating the quest of the historical Jesus, according to McKim. Remaras' book, which is also titled The Wolf and Bottle Fragments, led to the so-called first quest. Now, Remaras' view of Jesus and the Gospels are thus. He disputed the Jesus of history and the Christ of faith. He claimed Jesus was a revolutionary. He stated that the apostles made Jesus the centerpiece of Christianity, which means Jesus was the church's embellished Christ of faith. He also argued that Christianity's supernaturalism stood in contradiction to historical reality, again, a reality informed by empiricism, both in its view of miracles and its Christ of faith. Now, eventually, the first quest was abandoned, and this took place in the early part of the 20th century. As a result of Albert Schweitzer's extensive study of the historical Jesus, he concluded that under no circumstances could anything really be known about the historical Jesus, which, logically, that would be the case, because if you deny the historical trustworthiness of the Gospels, then you really have nothing to work with. So this ended the quest for the historical Jesus, at least the first one. Since scholars considered research on the Jesus, the Jesus of history was no longer relevant, the only recourse was to focus on the Christ of faith. Now this is interesting, because these liberals wanted to salvage the Jesus that we uh, talk about that's mentioned in the Bible. But they had a problem. They could no longer rely on the historical credibility of this Jesus, so now they had to, by default, move to the Christ of faith, which that in itself was driven by existentialism. And remember we mentioned earlier that romanticism, which led to existentialism, can take a perspective on the Bible that is non-historical and still retain a so-called faith in Jesus. And this is exactly what the liberal German New Testament scholar Rudolf Bultmann sought to do in his popular, well-known uh, what he was known for was the demythologization of the Gospels, which simply is this. By demythologizing the Gospels, Bultmann sought to strip the scripture of all elements of the supernatural. He also discounted the importance of historical research into the Jesus of the Gospels, and instead sought to seek experience of the Christ of faith, which is an existential experience. The Christ preached in the Hellenistic Church, according to Boltmann, was not the historical Jesus, but the Christ of faith and the Christian cult. That's found in the Dictionary of Jesus and the Gospels. It goes on to say that Boltmann contended that the thought world of the New Testament was essentially mythological, being shaped by myths drawn from Jewish apocalyptic and Gnosticism. Therefore, such myths caused Jesus to be presented as a heavenly redeemer in a cosmic struggle. Now, this was the massive influence of Bultmann in the mid-20th century, demythologizing the Gospels and instead embracing an existentialist approach to Jesus. Now, I don't think Bultmann ever called it existentialism, but essentially that's really what it comes down to. However, in 1953... 
students at Bolt Mon, heavily influenced by him, came to the point where they realized that his existentialist approach to the Gospels was inadequate. In fact, Bolt Mon's understanding of the New Testament Gospels was vigorously criticized, especially by a man named Ernst Casemann. Casemann did not agree with Bolt Mon, and in 1959, because of Casemann's influence and that of another German scholar, Bornkamm, they both launched what would be known as the second quest for the historical Jesus. Now, they abandoned that existentialism of Boltmann, and now they're going back to, essentially, the first quest, the, the, uh, the, uh, the approach that the first quest took. We're turning now to an attempt to find historical credibility of Jesus' life and, who he, and his work. This quest was launched out of the necessity to counteract Boltmann's destructive existentialist and Gnostic approach to the New Testament and Jesus' studies, but it too was plagued by the same problems that the first quest was plagued by, and that is it continued to utilize the critical theories that had brought about the problems of Rudolf Boltmann. Furthermore, as Kostenberger points out, proponents of this quest relied on extra-biblical material such as the Gospel of Thomas, Gospel of Hebrews, and other extra-biblical sources. So this second quest was off to a bad start from the very get-go. And the philosophical <clears throat> underpinnings of that second quest really did not help it at all. Given their substantial disconnect from the Gospels, it is evident that not much could be accomplished by using them as credible information. Now we're talking about the extra-biblical sources concerning the historical Jesus. As a result, this quest eventually lost much of its strength, yet residual efforts such as the Jesus Seminar continued to foster the second quest research. However, the Jesus Seminar has been discarded, well, disregarded by serious New Testament scholars. Not all of them, but a lot of them. Theologically, the stripping away of the historical incredibility or integrity of the Gospels, including demythologizing work done by Bultmann, uh, resulted in a revival, or I, you sh I should say, it appropriated unknowingly the ancient heresy of docetism, which was a heresy of the early church denying the humanity of Jesus, which includes his incarnation, death, and resurrection. So, by default, Boltmann, his approach to Jesus studies, was actually bringing into those studies a docetic, heretical perspective on Jesus. So this third quest has uh, stumbled as well. Now there is, or excuse me, the second quest. Now there is a third quest for the historical Jesus that is underway today. This quest focuses on Jesus' relationship to the Second Temple period, Second Temple Judaism, focusing on the historicity of Jesus. And one of the foremost contemporary New Testament scholars involved in the Third Quest is N.T. Wright. Now, I want to say that the Third Quest really is a significant departure from the first two, in that it does recognize the historical reliability and credibility of the Gospels at least the historical, <clears throat> its historiography is on the right track. In his book, Jesus and the Victory of God, N.T. Wright has an article titled, or one of his chapters titled, Back to the Future, the Third Quest. In that chapter, he notes, uh, I want to point out some observations that Wright makes that I think are, are uh, quite interesting. First, he says that there is now a real attempt to do history seriously. That's, that's good news. It means that they're actually appropriating historiography with integrity. There is a real willingness to be guided by first century sources. Remember, we looked at the liberal rationalistic school that discounted antiquarian or ancient documents. Thirdly, Jesus must be understood as a comprehensible and yet 
so to speak, crucifiable first century Jew. Fourthly, the pursuit of truth, historical truth, is what the third quest is all about. Serious historical method as opposed to the pseudo-historical use of homemade criteria, which I would say plagued the first two quests, is making a comeback in the third quest. And lastly, Wright says that he is suggesting no more than that Jesus be studied like any other figure of the ancient past. <coughs> now let me just say this uh, as an aside concerning history and historiography. The canons of historiography, one of them would be that ancient documents have to be given the benefit of the doubt as to their credibility at face value unless there is clear evidence of error. Either the author makes uh, fraudulent claims or statements or there is historical inaccuracies that are clearly evident and, and provable. But if an ancient document cannot be discredited by objective facts, then it has to be taken at face value. And that face value has to be accepted even if those ancient documents contain what could be considered extraordinary uh, material. And in the case of the New Testament Gospels, that would be the miraculous accounts. Now let me say this about miracles. Really, when you get right down to it, whether you're an atheist or a theist, you believe in miracles. The question is, how did those miracles come about? Case in point. If you're an atheist, you would have to embrace a naturalistic view of how the world came into existence. And the typical argument is that it didn't have a cause, that it just happened by random forces. Now, we don't see that happening today. That is not something that's repeatable. It cannot be duplicated in laboratory. We cannot observe it in nature. We're not seeing things pop into existence in and of themselves. So the fact that things exist at all could be a miracle or a miraculous event. So it's not really a question as to whether or not miracles take place. It really comes down to how do we explain the origin of the miracle? What is the cause? Now some would say from a naturalistic mindset, Natural forces, natural laws, well, logically, those have to have some point of origin as well. They just don't happen. So you have a predicament if you're a non-believer and hold to an empirical, rationalistic, naturalistic worldview, because there is still the need to believe or believe that things exist. And naturally, when one starts inquiring as to how those things exist, you ultimately, by infinite regress, end up with a miraculous starting point. So the difference between a theist and an atheist really is this. A theist believes that God is the first cause of all things. An atheist cannot explain how all things came into existence. So we both believe in miracles, but... I believe Christianity has the better explanation that is clearly defensible. And the Apostle Paul makes this argument in Romans chapter 1. So this concludes lecture 7 concerning the uh, criticism of the Gospels. Uh, our next lecture will begin our study, investigation into the biblical books themselves, and we will be beginning with the Gospels. And we will start with the book of Matthew and work our way through to the book of Revelation in the lectures to follow. Okay, I hope you had the time to go over lecture number seven and you learn something, you take some notes and you, you're filling up your knowledge, your brain cells with, you know, materials to help you grow in your faith. You always could come back and listen to the videos over and over again. So you could, you know, learn, copy it, write it down, record it again. So you could, when you're in the car, you could always listen to it. 
you know the materials are there just for you while you listen to it i hope you had a chance to subscribe to our page like the video and share it you know so others could 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 also learn from it and 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 enjoy it too at the same time so and and teach others about the word of god and also now the video is over take some time go look at the link on the bottom and donate to our ministry so we could have funds to help those who are less fortunate than ourselves who are in need of our services okay Please, may God bless you. May the glory of God protect you, watch over you, and keep you safe. And constantly be a shield around you. Peace. Shalom.